Hi, this is Kim Shanley for Tennis Reach. Today is part two of our Federer Forehand Paradigm series. And the subject of this lesson is dropping into the slot. Remember, in our first lesson, we talked about this slotted position, rather a kind of a low slot at this point, and then driving the hand, the butt of the racket towards the net post, and then just working on the swing action, bringing the racket up in an arcing motion uh, and then just through for the windshield wiper follow through. And I just had you working just on this piece, the most critical piece of the whole action, stroke action is the swing action. But before we get to the swing, we have to get to the slot. And so that's what I wanna to cover today. So at Tennis Reach, we look at all sports, the universal moves and see what we can learn and what we can reinforce. Well, in terms of a slot, there's a slot position in all hitting and all throwing actions. So in baseball, as you'll see in the picture of Derek Jeter, you know, the, the hands start out out here, resting the bat sort of on the shoulder, but then as the hands are driven to the ball, he enters the slot position. In golf, we have the balls always at, at our feet, of course, but we take the racket back. And then as we come in, this space here that we've occupied when we've taken the rack, the club head back, then starts to move in close to the body. And this right elbow that was up here starts to drop in what they call the magic move. In pitching, you know, quarterbacks will talk about the slot of their quarterback throw and pitchers baseball the same way. They have a certain orientation. Now, so what is the slot? It's really the maximum loaded position of the body for efficient movement. So the hand and the racket and all these things are positioned differently to get to the slot according to the circumstances but the slot is always sort of this optimum orientation and loading of the body prior to action. It's sort of setting the spring as we covered in a previous lesson. Now in tennis in particular, the slot varies because we have all sorts of situations for where the ball is located, how much time we have. In baseball and golf, it's much more of a similar orientation at all times. So tennis we have a lot more variety in our slot but uh, the same essentials so if we look at Federer in his initial position the turn of the racket and the hands the racket tip pointed up hand non-hitting hand on the throat of the racket looks something like this and he's just sort of orienting is sort of coiling turning to the side and again why this is important is we don't want to split the hands right away like so many players do, you know, like this. Why? Well, there's a lot of different reasons, but we want to keep building the coiling and loading action of the body and the hips and the shoulders with this sort of action. And if we go like this, well, there's nothing left to coil. We're, we've already, the sprung has been unsprung. So we want to preserve the energy and power that we're building and you see this with Federer on this initial move. So as the hands split from the racket we see a sinking motion both with the racket, the knee and the right hip because we're compressing energy into this right side and coiling that energy into this right hip and this right side. So even after the initial drop we still see the racket sort of oriented forward, maybe 45 degrees. And it's only as this elevator motion sort of goes down and Federer's elbow unbends and gets down here into what we call patting the dog position. Now we don't actually pat the dog, but it sort of gives you that orientation and the racket's facing out approximately towards the side fence. So we're compressing down and lowering just 
natural in turning the racket nice and smoothly. So the racket's getting turned, and then we get down to the lowest level, at least on a low shot like what we're going to show you, this slotted position. Now from here, we see this racket start to orient and pivot back. And here's the critical magic move in tennis. Just like there's a magic move in, in golf where you take the, the take back rather high, but then when you start to downswing, this right elbow comes in tucked close to the body. This connects the upper body and the lower body and connects the hitting arm with the torso and the hips and the knees. And remember, this is the number one error that we see in most recreational players, is the disconnect between upper body and lower body and an action that is mostly an arm only action. Well, this is the key when we turn and we drop the racket in the sideways position. Now this elbow, which is sort of out here, will pivot to the inside, okay? And it's a much larger pivot on a low shot like this than you might imagine. And the racket butt is pointing to the net post. And now the orientation of the racket goes from facing the, the face of the racket, facing the ground, to a much more sideways position that we're gonna move into contact with. So once we've reached this position, which is kind of up a low slot shot, that means it's sort of gonna be a rally ball with a lot of topspin on it for Federer. Uh, we see the tip of the racket down like we talked about the other week. Uh, and then we see the arm driven forward with the racket tip held back. So we don't start swinging around here to have the sweeping action that is so detrimental to a good hit action. We wanna come up in the inside of the ball and drive this racket forward before this starts to turn. And that's exactly what we see in all the great forehands with Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic. So this position is still, we call it the static slot position because we haven't really done much action. We've oriented the whole body, coil loaded, but we haven't really started to unspring. As we drive forward, we will start to unspring. The hips start to do this pelvic hip snap, arms driven forward, and finally, once the racket gets in the hands are much closer to the ball, then we finally see the racket starting to come around and up. And even at contact, the racket starts to square but there's still a slight lag and there's a lag in the position of the hand in front of the racket throughout this whole time. And then as it comes in, there's still a slight rag, lag here because we want leverage on, you know, if we're here, we have no leverage on the ball with our hand and elbow structure. So this is the reason for the classic two bend forehand. And people ask, well, what about the straight arm shot? Well, yeah, on some high balls, you'll see a much straighter arm, but you'll still see a slight bend. You'll still see this kind of connecting pivot of the elbow into the torso and chest and shoulder area, and the still lifting of the body as we see it. So we were looking at a low sort of low slot position for a rally, a, a very extreme kind of top spin stroke, not as much drive, nice safe shot over the net for Federer, but what happens if we get up, Federer gets a higher ball, it can step into the court. Now, where does the racket go and how is it oriented into the slot? Again, we see things differently this way. So from here, we're not gonna take all this drop down here because the ball's up here and we have to hit it more quickly to take this offensive shot that we want. So this is a much simpler sort of drop into the slot from here and then the racket is just more rotated more like this. It's just slightly down. The racket's still pointed out generally towards the net post. We still have the arm action going out to the side and the squaring up, but now it's higher and you might have a see a straighter arm as well here. But the commonalities are what we want to look at, not 
you know there's a whole, whole unique position of this slot position for the forehand but what are the commonalities well the first commonality is this rotation and pivot of the elbow this magic move whether it's way up here and then you know something like this there's always this sort of rotation in for a low ball arm and elbow comes much closer to the body but we're really trying to have this sort of waggle action where the racket is working in counter sort of rotation to our body and we can load our shoulder and right torso and hip by this turn so again in contrast to what most people do which is you know this sort of action well there's no loading here the second commonality is that this racket is lower than the hand position and generally all this is lower than the incoming ball so the next phase of the drop to the slot for Federer is just gradually moving this racket from this vertically sort of oriented forward oriented position more toward a side position but just letting the racket sort of drop they call it the elevator now how far down in the elevator do we let it drop well on the ball we'll see he's going to drop almost with his arm extended because he's going for a low kind of rally topspin shot other times again we showed you this the slot's going to be much higher and much quicker to develop and not quite as much fishtailing around as we see in some low shots. Let me say one other thing about this way the racket is moved and oriented around the body. So a lot of our power in the, our ground strokes comes from this coiling action of around our body is sinking. And again, we want the racket to become thing, something like a whip not exactly like a whip because we don't want to be too whippy through contact but this racket is basically going to be traveling in this kind of whipping circular manner and so when we're talking about you know Federer's drop he's starting this process very slowly letting the face of the racket face the ground until he gets to the point where he's going to start to turn this racket Okay, but it's all very gradual, very smooth. There's no rushing, you know, no break of the arms, no uh, pointing the racket tip back towards the uh, fence. Again, this isn't going to give us any whip. This is a pushing, pushing type, type of shot. And for those old proponents of it, who used to use it, like Jimmy Connors, John Macaro, it very much looks like a push. You know, that was the 70s. This is now. We went much more of a dynamic action and much more of a whipping action. So the stage then goes from the drop to the elevator to, to wherever height that you're going to start to position the racket to come up on for the top spin shot to a slight turning and opening of this face in preparation for the actual contact moment. Obviously the racket's not in position to hit anything when it's oriented like this. We have to gradually get to an orientation that's more sideways to the ground. Now once we get to this stage, the bottom of the elevator where we call pat the head of the dog, we don't actually move the racket like this, but obviously it sort of gives us a mental idea of, you know, how the racket is positioned, you know, uh, with the racket face facing the ground here. And then this curling, again, we're storing up energy in our arm or torso or lower hip as we sink into this. And this final phase, especially on a low shot, typically uh, in the Federer paradigm, but it's true of Djokovic and Nadal, is this racket tip drops okay and this is a very important point almost all the junior players recreational players do not drop this racket tip far enough or drop it at all essentially and this is another problem with this swing paradigm that we talked about they have a horizontal kind of action thought 
process going on. And so this is a very strong grip here. I take it back here and I, if I'm just hitting with my wrist and my arm, this would be the strong position to take in. But we're not hitting with our arm and our wrist, we're hitting with our body. So we're coiling down here and creating some extra coil here that we're gonna unleash as we move forward into the shot. In contrast, uh, on the backhand side, we almost see all the players on the circuit, especially the women players, they all have steadier and better backhands than they have forehands. Well, one reason is on their backhand side, they don't have a problem with dropping the tip of the racket because they have two hands to use. And now this feels stronger and safer in order for them to execute their shots. On the forehand side, again, you know, strength is our weakness. We believe we want a strong grip all the time when we don't really need it. We're gonna let our body move into a leveraged position at the hit. We don't need our arm and our wrist to do the work. Once, once the slot is established and on this low ball is very much down in here and very much a sideways orientation, then again, we don't start swinging the racket. We drive the racket forward before we swing. and the butt of the racket is, is being driven sort of towards the net post, holding the tip, rack, tip of the racket back as long as possible. We don't pull the racket handle straight to the target. That's gonna to start to swing this racket around and close off the face at contact, which we don't want. So again, how deep this swing to the target linear model keeps interfering with what we are trying to do in a proper stroke. Uh, so we have to, you know, practice these things all the time to make sure that we are executing it according to this paradigm, not the old paradigm. So of course the final phase is we've reached a static slot they call it basically you know we've oriented our body positioned as coiled but we really haven't done that much with it you know we're about ready to unspring but we haven't sprung yet and so that begins this forward drive and then led by the hips and lower body and the straightening of the knees the turning of the hips then we're going to bring this racket into position for a leveraged hit and typically the racket handle racket is lower than the hand and the racket lags behind the hand because we're gonna to try to leverage, especially at the beginning of contact for this inside out stroke. We talk about this process as touching the ball and this racket face is not perpendicular to the ground, but it's set back some, some, uh, at some angle. And as the contact starts to take place, again, the racket is still not square, but in the process of generating this hit and turning at this phase, then the racket does square and the ball is directed towards, literally towards whatever target we're pointing to. So we don't just square the racket, we are squaring the racket. So in this process here, we're gonna be turning and we'll be focusing on that in the next couple lessons. What's the relationship and how does this feel in this turning motion? It's not a hinge, a horizontal hinging motion. And that's what we want to avoid, or it's not a scooping motion. One last thing I'll leave you with is what Arnold Palmer said about golf and teaching golf. He says, you have to commit to your swing. And it's exactly the same thing in tennis. We have to commit to our swing and grow confident in all of these other emotions that we're going to produce the kind of effect that we want. And again, we have, with the racket starting at a shallow position, players tend to want to create topspin by rolling over the ball or hooking it or some other you know flipping or hooking or sweeping action and this is contrary to Arnold Palmer what Arnold Palmer is saying is we have to build a stroke where 
This is going to be fluid and we can commit all the way through contact and all the way through our follow through.